Welcome everyone to the final Astrophysics McGill public, public live stream of the year. If you are a frequent streamer, you'll know that you can watch us on Zoom or Facebook. If you need a copy of the links, they're in the chat, in the chat right now if you have to send that to someone. Uh, today, uh, Matt Lundy, graduate student at McGill University, will be giving us a talk on the most energetic light in the, in the universe. Matt works on the Veritas collaboration under the supervision of Ken Reagan. You'll be able to ask your questions to Matt in the end at, at the end, uh, but please feel free to write, but please write them in the Zoom chat or in the comments of the Facebook live stream uh, as the lecture goes, and I will sort them and pass them off to our speaker as time permits at the end. So without further ado, Matt, you can please take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. So today I'm going to be talking about something that is near and dear to my heart. And these are cosmic rays and gamma rays. And I hopefully want to set this up for you guys in the kind of form of an initial mystery or initial question um, that's been kind of plaguing us for quite some time. And in the little abstract, where I said this is a centuries old mystery. So this is a mystery that's been going on for um, over 100 years. And that's really, really true. And the mystery really starts um, with our first hint, which is this little device here, which is something that looks so simple you can make it at your home, indeed you can, and it's called an electroscope. And so humble beginnings for the start of this, and what an electroscope is, is it's a tiny device with two charged pieces of metal in the center of this isolated uh, container. And so you shouldn't have any undue influence from outside forces. And so when you charge these two little metal, um, a metal, little piece of metal, they'll end up separating, repelled by common positive charges. And when they repel, you don't expect them to come back unless something begins to act on them. And so this was an interesting little device that was created around the turn of the century um, in about 1900. And people began studying and experimenting with all sorts of different places you could put this thing. Because what they found is that these little little tiny um, pellets or little tiny piece of metal began slowly coming together over time, which meant that there was some sort of invisible action that was managing to seep into this container and change the positive charges into neutral charges again, moving these things close together. And what that invisible um, undue influence here is, is something that we've been working on for um, 100 years. Um, and we've gotten pretty sure on what the answer is, but where um, these little ghosts are coming from is much less certain. And so that's really the initial question is how do you track this down? Well, you start moving this to different places, this little device. Um, and as it gets closer to the source of these little ghosts here, then it should bring these little pieces closer together more rapidly. And as you move further away, the inverse. And so the initial question people start to ask is, is this coming from the earth or is this coming from space? And it seems like a very simple question. Um, and so this hunt began. The first thing you can do is put it deep underwater, bring it really, really close to the earth while insulating yourself from forces uh, from above. And certainly Pacini did this, Domenico Pacini, and he found that as he brought it down, the rate at which these things came together, which is the amount of this undue influence began to decrease which meant that although some of it was still coming from the earth, there was a greater amount coming from elsewhere. And the opposite you can also do. So instead of going down closer to the earth, you can head closer to space. And if you head up the tallest, one of the tallest structures at the time, the Eiffel Tower, um, which is exactly what Peter T. Wolf did, had ascending over 200 meters um, and sitting up there for four days and four nights in blustery, wintry conditions, he found that sure enough, there was a slight drop. So now you have conflicting answers, right? Oftentimes in um, a lot of these hunts, and as you'll continue to see throughout this talk, um, there is always conflicting answers, but then with more data comes better solutions. And so if the Eiffel Tower isn't tall enough, what's next? Well, at the time, we can't really launch satellites or, um, or anything outside of the atmosphere, but we can start to head higher and higher and closer and closer to space. And so that's exactly what Victor Hess did. And so Victor Hess here took it a step further. In 1912, he took his most famous balloon flight. 
And so what this balloon flight is, is taking these devices that I mentioned to you that measure the kind of amount of this, um, of this radiation, um, and he ascended over 5,000 meters in his balloon flight. And as he continued to ascend, he continued to measure the amount of this radiation over time. And what he found is shown just right here on uh, the right. So on the left here, you could see uh, the quite famous pictures with a lot of these kinds of um, sad children that you only see in black and white photos. I'm sure they would have been smiling and applauding for the balloon flight if the pictures were taken today. Um, but anyways, uh, to the right here, we have the kind of two, um, two results from these balloon flights. And just on this way, in this direction, is how high he's going. And on the other side here, we have the kind of amount of this of this un, unseen um, unseen influence, and so as he ascends, it gets more and more strong, which means that this must be coming from space, and so this is really the hunt for what we now call cosmic rays, and for this he got the Nobel Prize, um, and so. While this was going on, while he was ascending in his balloon and making these experiments to confirm that these things were from space, another question that was being asked simultaneously is, okay, it's coming from space, but what is it? What makes up this invisible uh, radiation? And for that, for that purpose, uh, these ionizing cloud chambers were developed. And what an ionizing cloud chamber is, is something that can track charged particles moving through it by condensing along the trails of these individual particles. So as these unseen charged particles pass through this large uh, chamber, they end up leaving these ionized trails behind them, charging the particles behind them. And as they charge, we then have condensation behind them, which leaves these little clouds you can see in these pictures. And the type of particle, the mass of the particle, the charge of the particle, all these fundamental particle parameters affects the shape of the cloud. So you can use these clouds in order to determine what these, um, this invisible radiation now made visible is actually made of. And Charles Wilson's kind of what the famous guy for this. And he began measuring these cosmic rays with the first cloud chambers in 1911. And so even if you set up these one of these cloud chambers anywhere on Earth, unless you're burying way deep down underground in some sort of mine, you're going to see these little trails begin to appear. Um, and he got the Nobel Prize for this. But these, I'll, I'll show you quickly a video of what's going on here. So you get a little bit of the dynamics. And so um, these cloud chambers placed near um, a radiating source. So these aren't all rays from space. These are um, induced rays. Uh, but what you can see here is kind of the different shapes and patterns. And hopefully just by eye, you're able to pick out that some of these are long straight uh, trails. These are um, muon trails. And then you also see these kind of more squiggly trails coming from um, electrons now made visible. These electron trails are, um, appear in this and just by eye you can actually manage to visually separate these particles and you see these little fat blobs here these are alpha particles the charge center of kind of a nucleus um, stripped bare and sent into this chamber and so additionally these these kinds of secondary reactions so not just an initial reaction but secondary also appear in the upper atmosphere so in 1937, Pierre Auger uh, first detected one of these particle showers. I'm mentioning it now and just keep it in the back of your mind because we're gonna talk about these particle showers in a bit later. Um, but what this is, is these particles, instead of reacting in this ionizing chamber, instead they're interacting with particles in our atmosphere. And in doing so, they end up creating these large cascades of secondary particles, secondary particle interactions. Um, I'll explain those in a briefly, but what you can see is that this only happens with when particles have tremendous energies. And so in 1937 already, we knew a couple things about these uh, particles, that they were made up of a lot of the common particles that we know now, and that also um, they're tremendously energetic. And this energy is going to be a kind of ongoing mystery. So just keep that in mind. So what are, are, what are they made of now that we have these cloud chambers to kind of figure out some of this stuff and other detectors as well? Well, they're charged particles traveling through space is primarily what we refer to when we're calling talking about cosmic rays. Um, about 85% of cosmic rays are protons, just the normal proton that you, you know and love traveling through space, ejected at high velocities. 
Um, about 12% are alpha particles, these larger nucleuses, which contain um, multiple protons and neutrons, but they're just the common atoms that you've heard of without electrons uh, traveling through space. And the interesting part about them is the energy that I talked about previously. But where do they come from? Well, cosmic rays, when they were looking, what they did was they said, okay, we've got all these um, we were, we're able to track these things, but where are they coming from? So if you look up into the sky and measure where cosmic rays are coming from, you see that they're almost what we call isotropic, which means that in any direction you look, you see cosmic rays coming. And they're not coming from, um, or they at least don't appear to be coming from, singular points in the sky. And so you don't look up, like when we look up into the sky and we look at stars, we see all these little points of light. We know exactly where the light's coming from. It's coming from that star. And if you just follow the light back to its source, you see a star. Uh, but cosmic rays seem to be just coming from uh, everywhere. So what's going on? Well, remember I said cosmic rays are charged. And not only on Earth is there a magnetic field, and not only around magnets are there magnetic fields, but there's kind of ambient magnetic fields all throughout space. Um, and these magnetic fields end up interacting with the charged particles in the same way a magnet would interact with another magnet. It ends up deflecting it and changing the trajectory of these particles. And so instead of being able to directly look up into the sky and see where these particle comes from, the particle has changed its, um, its direction. So its arrival direction here on Earth doesn't mean um, much of anything significant. Um, and so you can see here some sort of source. And then uh, initially the photons, which are particles of light, come directly to us. But charged cosmic rays end up taking a really difficult path, passing through all of these magnetic fields, ending up getting deflected. So directionality on cosmic rays isn't a good indicator to help us try and figure out where they're coming from, because you can't just look at the direction and figure out um, where the source is. So instead, you have to use some other indicator. And the perfect indicator for where these particles are coming from are other energetic products. Basically, photons can also have increasing energy. These particles of light can keep getting more and more energetic. And if you see a particle of light that matches the same energy as the cosmic ray, then you know that both of these things had to be created in very um, energetic environments. And because of that, you can match up sources for cosmic rays indirectly by looking at where these really energetic photons are. And so basically photons are really the key to figure out and solve where these cosmic rays are coming from. We know they're coming from space, but what in space is making them? And so I keep talking about how energetic they are, um, but let's put this into some sort of context, right? So I show a plot here and I, you know, I promise this is one of the last ones. Um, and on the bottom here, we have in this direction, how energetic the particle is. And I'll put some more context to these numbers. And then on the other side, we have how many of those particles we measure here on Earth. And so you can see this little number here. This is one per meter squared per second. So if you were to place a meter squared of material, or if you were to lie it down on the ground, roughly, um, you'd see only one particle per second pass through you um, towards these kinds of lower energies. That's still a lot considering as you move down this, you now have, once you get to these energies, these kind of uh, energies up here, these higher energy cosmic rays. So I'll, I'll, I, I, if I haven't mentioned this already, this blue line is the number of cosmic rays matching these energies at these rates. You have here one per meter squared per year. So if the same thing, you're lying down, you're roughly a meter squared, uh, if you've been eating, you know, a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner, maybe you're a little bit more, um, you'd only get one particle at these energies per year. And as you keep moving down here, you only end up, if you're one kilometer squared, which would require quite a bit of Thanksgiving dinner, um, but I wouldn't put it past some people, um, you'd only get one particle per year. And so what are these energies? Well, here on the graph is 
the LHC, one of the most powerful particle accelerators on Earth, could only reach the maximum energies roughly around here on the graph, whereas cosmic rays can increase that by orders and orders of magnitude. So 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 times as energetic. And we can actually measure these particles here on Earth. They're not just traveling through space. We actually measure them in our detectors. So one gram of the highest energy cosmic rays that we can measure here on Earth could power the Earth for 1,000 years. And But don't think that cosmic rays are an energy source because to collect that much, you're only getting one particle per kilometer squared per year. So it's an extremely low rate. These are extremely rare particles, but they're tremendously energetic. More energetic than anything we can do um, here on Earth. Even if we were to build a particle accelerator all the way around the Earth, not just around Geneva, like uh, the LA, um, we still wouldn't be able to produce these energies. And so remember how I said we have to use these uh, the light to figure out and how light can get more and more energetic. Well, what does that mean? So when we look with our eyes, what we see is the kind of common spectrum of light, it's called. And so this spectrum here, which comes from specter originally, um, when people were looking through prisms and separating light like the um, Pink Floyd cover, they would see this kind of rainbow appear. And this, this rainbow here is known as the kind of spectrum of light. And this um, spectrum here is all the colors we can see. But light, photons, these kind of particles of light, can go to either side of here and still um, and still exist. And so we kind of like to think of the visible light, you can think of it as a single octave on a piano. But the whole picture is much, much more, right? So uh, if we go to either side, more energetic light is this ultraviolet light, and then less energetic light is this infrared light. And as we continue to go, so yes, energy is moving down here on the scales, Eventually, if we keep adding octaves to the side, we can get to gamma rays. So somewhere in between here, we have X-rays. On the other side here, we have radio waves. But what we really want, what's really in the mean is gamma rays. And so if you ever tried to you know, play some sort of classical piano and you've only tried to use a single octave, you get a really bad picture of what the song sounds like. But if you were to extend this to kind of you know, a full full piano and a little bit more. I've added quite a few um, little octaves here, but then uh, you'll eventually get to the beautiful, beautiful um, sound that is gamma rays. Um, and this is true for astronomy as well. So when we look up into the night sky, we're only looking at that optical uh, component, that small little octave. And so this is all the stars that we see. And we see kind of this large dark clouds here obscuring. And this is just sitting at one point on the earth. But if we were to look all the way around the Earth and kind of unwrap that map, we get a picture that looks like this. So this is what the entire sky looks like to um, optical telescopes. And so this is a common picture you might see and picture for yourself when you're thinking about what the universe looks like. And these dark clouds here are these large dust structures that end up absorbing light. Um, the infrared sky, so moving down the other side, looks quite a bit different. The dust structures now are bright instead of being dark. Um, and so you end up with a completely different picture. All of these colors I should mention are all false color images after the optical. And what a false color image means is that these photons aren't visible to our eyes, right? So you can't see gamma rays, even if they hit your eyeball, right? So instead, the way that astronomers make these pictures is by inducing a color that they, they think kind of represents it best. And so in this image here, we have um, uh, quite a red for an infrared picture, but we can move to a more energetic part of the sky and the sky looks different once again. Um, and so you can see right here, this is x-rays. Remember, this is all false colors. So even, but, but the, the proportions and the colors do mean different energies. So different energies are represented by different colors. And as you're getting more and more energetic, you can see that the colors are changing for these sources. And then finally, we get to the beautiful sky as I see it, uh, which is the gamma ray sky. And so this is the gamma ray view of the universe. And so all of these sources are producing that super high energy light. So moving way down the octave scale and producing this, the, these, these energies that are comparable, um, not these ones precisely, but some sources in this map are capable of producing energies um, high enough to produce some of the cosmic rays we're seeing. 
And you can see here these little points here. All of this is real. Um, and these are all of our beautiful candidates for where these cosmic rays are coming from. Remember, this is the cosmic ray sky. So um, really, really difficult to see where anything's coming from in this sky in terms of sources. But when we flick back to this sky, we now have this beautiful list of candidates. And so some, um, some telescopes, like the one that's made this map, label each one of these sources, and then it could be followed up by um, telescopes capable of measuring higher and higher energies. Um, and so one question that you might ask yourself is, um, why are we constantly bombarded by gamma rays? Um, you might not be thinking that, um, but it is a good question. Um, and so visible light, that little, little tiny section of light, is what really reaches us here on the ground at Earth. And so if you look up here, what this is, is how much of that light reaches us here on Earth. And one thing you should notice is that one of the lowest points on this graph is optical light. And that's no coincidence that we can see this light, and it's the light that ends up um, actually reaching us here on Earth. As we move into this less energetic light, it ends up um, ends up being um, slightly absorbed by the atmosphere. Eventually, radio becomes transparent again, which is why we can have a lot of radio observatories here on the ground. But then gamma rays end up being completely absorbed. So are we doomed? Can we not build gamma ray telescopes unless we send them out into space on satellites like they're showing here? Well, we can use the trick of, if you recall, way, way back, these air showers. And so when these particles aren't making it to the ground, there's other particles that are. And so when these particles end up coming into their atmosphere, they don't just get absorbed and then disappear. Instead, what happens is that they go through these initial uh, stages of the atmosphere and end up going through a process called um, pair production. And what this is, is creating matter and antimatter in the upper atmosphere. And that matter and antimatter ends up reinteracting and producing large amounts of cascading reactions all the way down. And this happens with each and every kind of high energy particle that ends up interacting in the upper atmosphere, ends up producing these beautiful cascades. Um, so I'm going to use interchangeably words like electromagnetic cascade and particle shower, because all of them are referring to different processes all in the same kind of uh, similar event. And so we can't measure those particles directly even, because some of those are traveling very, very energetically for kind of common detectors. But there's a secondary to this secondary interaction. And so if you work down your chain, you now have all of these energetic particles raining down, all spurned from an initial one particle, whether that be a photon, a particle of light, or whether that be a cosmic ray, both are producing air showers. And particles traveling faster than the speed of light in air so that's a big uh, thing is that um, light, while it travels through air, it doesn't travel at the fastest um, speed. Um, the speed of light is a constant you might have heard over and over again uh, from different kind of talks or YouTube videos or whatever. And so that's really true in a vacuum, but in air, light can travel um, slower. And when a particle travels faster than the light is traveling in that medium, then what's gonna happen is that you're gonna produce the equivalent of a sonic boom. So sonic booms occur when, say, a jet begins traveling faster and faster. Eventually, you end up with the sound that's being produced by this jet overlapping with different amounts of uh, these wave fronts. So a sound is a wave. And as these wave fronts begin to collide, you end up forming um, a shock cone. And so this shock cone we sound is the sonic boom. But particles can also do in a, a roughly similar process um, with regards to um, light and produce these kinds of versions of a light sonic boom. And that's called Cherenkov radiation or the Cherenkov effect. And Cherenkov radiation appears wherever we have energetic particles that end up exceeding the speed of light in that medium, oftentimes air. And so um, oftentimes in the heart of nuclear reactors, if we look in there and actually just put a camera, we see this blue hue. And so Cherenkov um, radiation, these sonic booms, have this characteristic um, color. And that characteristic color is this, is, this, is this really famous blue. 
And so this blue hue you see in this image is the same kind of color as what's being produced from the particles in these air showers. So these air showers they're producing coming down are causing this large pool of blue light to also appear along with the air shower. And so that's what's imaged here is these particle comes in, it produces this large cascade of secondary particles um, through, um, through this uh, pair production. And then you see here this large blue pool of light, which we can measure. And that's caused by these particles traveling faster than the speed of light in air. And so you see here quite a few little telescopes on the ground, which might tell you what um, an astronomer might want to do, which is capture this light. But this light happens extremely quickly. So in this flash, it looks like, oh, this is easy. But this is a nanosecond um, of time. So these particles, recall, are traveling faster than the speed of light in the medium. So these air showers end up going through their full evolution extremely rapidly. And so this the, the light that comes with them is also just gone in a nanosecond flash. But this is just optical light. And so if you were to look up and have sensitive enough eyes that could um, capture this because it happens so rapidly and is so dim, um, you would be able to see these constantly all around you. You would look up in the sky and every second or so you would see one of these flashes, um, even more actually. And so, like I said, if you're, um, if you're interested in trying to figure out where gamma rays are coming from, because gamma rays are actually, um, the, the direction matters, then you could capture these things using large telescopes. And so if you build a series of telescopes, just optical telescopes using normal mirrors and normal cameras, you would be able to um, capture and image these air showers from and be able to reconstruct the position of the original gamma ray. So you take a picture of this cone of light from a bunch of different angles. And then once you have all those pictures of the cone of light, which look like this, these little tiny um, bases of the cone of light, you can figure out where the initial gamma ray is actually coming from, which is a remarkably powerful tool. And telescopes like this have been built um, and have been operational for over a decade or even more than that. Um, decade has just been the recent generation of these things. They've been around for many decades. And so telescopes but that are currently operational include ones like this where I work, um, the Veritas telescope. And so just for scale, you can see all these cars behind. But if you were to walk up to this thing, like these uh, couple of uh, tourists that I pulled from a photo, um, you can see that these, these telescopes are absolutely enormous. And so these four telescopes working in tandem are able to capture um, the light from these particle showers. And from that light, they're able to figure out where gamma rays are coming from. And from that, in turn, we could begin to figure out where these cosmic rays are coming from. And so if we actually look for the sources that these gamma rays may be coming from, there's kind of three steps that you need. The first thing is that you need to get a particle to be very energetic. And so um, to create gamma rays or cosmic rays, the first thing you need to do is find a way to accelerate particles. And so on Earth, we accelerate particles in large particle accelerators that use magnetic fields. And so you might imagine you know, what, where, where this is going. But first, get a particle very, very, very energetic. And then second, you want to crash it into some target. And so this target here I image as another particle but this can also be a magnetic field. It could be other particles. But once you have this thing interacting with something else, then voila, you get all of these gamma rays. Um, it doesn't actually need to directly collide, but, and the easiest way to accelerate all this stuff is with shocks and blast waves. And so when you look at a, um, uh, an explosion, there's an initial point of energy injection at the center, whether that be a bomb or whatever. Um, and all of the particles in the air end up getting accelerated from this initial point. And the form that that takes is this large shock or blast wave. And so you often see that kind of shock wave or blast wave end up propagating from a, a lot of explosions. 
But what we can do in terms of uh, gamma ray astronomy is if we're trying to figure out what might be producing gamma rays, the first thing we can do is begin to look for these shocks. And so one of the places that we most readily find shocks in the universe is with high mass stars. So I talk about high mass stars. So you know the sun, everyone knows the sun. Sun's a great star, love the sun. Um, but the sun is not a high mass star. So high mass stars are about 80, 100 times the mass of the sun. And so that's what we're looking at in this picture is one of these systems. And so this is actually a binary system of two high mass stars. And so these two high mass stars are gravitationally bound like the earth is to the sun. And they end up orbiting one another. And in that orbit, these, these stars are also ejecting huge amounts of mass. And so there's about 300 earth worth of mass. So the entire earth is being ejected 300 times from the system every year. And so the system has this huge cloud of ejecting dust and gas. And because of the um, tight orbit of these two stars, it ends up creating all of these different shock fronts. And so I'll show you kind of what I'm talking about. But if you look just at the surrounding area around it, you can see this large amount of dust um, being pushed out from this central uh, region where we had this kind of initial amount of giant outbursts. So the star ends up ejecting much more than several hundred uh, Earth's worth of mass into the surrounding medium, and now continues to interact with that expanding dust cloud. And so um, the beautiful picture in the optical looks like this, and the beautiful picture in the gamma rays looks like this. So gamma ray telescopes, very powerful. But because the technique requires kind of so many steps of um, separation from the original photon, um, the pictures end up being a little bit blurrier. So instead of getting, you know, beautiful resolution like this, you end up with a little dot. Uh, but this beautiful dot, at least to me, is very beautiful because what it's showing is that in this system here, the particles are reaching tremendous energies. And so they're reaching, um, they're reaching uh, millions of times the energy that we'd be able to see in other wavelengths. And so just for kind of a visual of what this is compared to our sun. So this little, 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 little dot down here that might not even send over um, zoom in terms of resolution um, is our sun as compared to one of the stars in this system, uh, what we call Eta Carina A. And then these planets, which are not to scale, but the distances are to scale. So the same distance that the sun is from the earth, almost, Eta Carina is from another star. So you could basically pop out the earth and pop in another star into our system and then pump up their masses to be tremendously larger. And you get this highly, highly energetic system, unlike the earth and the sun system. And so this is what it looks like. So I'm going to show you a hydrodynamic simulation. So this is all in the computer. Of course, we don't have a lot of, we can't travel there and image it directly. But what we can do is infer a lot of the properties from kind of still images that we take over time. And from that, we're able to simulate what this system should look like and should evolve like with much higher time resolution and much more detail. And so that's what's being shown here. So if we watch, Recall, I said these two stars are orbiting one another. So we're looking at it down into the plane. And you can see the tinier star here as it begins to move around the much larger star. And these are constantly pushing out matter in these, in these powerful winds moving away from the stars. And so you end up with this large amount of matter ejection that ends up being, um, that ends up getting really energetic when the one tiny star ends up coming to closest approach with the other star. And if you were to like look at this thing more three-dimensionally, fold it out this way, you could see that this matter is being ejected, um, not uniformly, but in preferred directions based on this orbit. And so you could also model the matter, which they're doing here, as kind of a large three-dimensional model. And so that's an ideal source of gamma rays, but it's not the only source of gamma rays. And so other sources of gamma rays include these things we like to call pulsar wind nebula. And pulsar wind nebula like the crab, which I'm showing here, um, this is an optical picture of the crab. And so if you're looking at this, just like early astronomers did, um, I don't see a crab, but uh, perhaps you do. 
Uh, but the Crab Nebula here was detected in gamma rays by instruments as early as 1989. Um, and the way that they found that this was being powered was not by a high mass star, but what comes after a high mass star. So the decayed, this dead corpse of a high mass star. So after an explosion, um, what's left is this core of a high mass star. And that core is still about two times the mass of the sun. But what's happened is that as it's begun to collapse, it eventually reaches a point where it's only about 20 kilometers um, across. So you have this object that's twice the mass of our sun, but could fit into um, roughly the island of Montreal. And so these pulsars here, or neutron stars, um, are, are highly magnetic, highly um, exotic systems where a lot of our understanding of how matter works, how solids, liquids, and gases begins to break down as new forms of matter are actually what make up this super dense object. And in addition, the high magnetic fields provide these perfect locations to bring particles to high energies the same way that um, we can imagine particles being accelerated here on Earth by high magnetic fields. And so you end up with these systems driving um, energies into their surrounding dust and gas. And that surrounding dust and gas actually came from the explosion at the end of the star's life. And so you end up with, a, with the core of the star still interacting with this outer edge and producing um, some of the highest energy places in the universe. And so the picture in gamma rays also uh, <laughs> might look the same as the last picture. But once again, what this is showing is that indeed, um, in the core of the system and in the surrounding area, you're getting these highly energetic um, photons and highly energetic particles. And so if you just want, if you still can't see it, perhaps in your mind, this is a three-dimensional representation of the cloud. And so it'll rotate here. And so this is showing three different wavelengths in false color. Um, whoops. So like the same way that um, I showed you different maps of the world, uh, sorry, of the, uh, of the sky, these different colors here represent different parts of the wavelength band. So this isn't what the thing would look like if you were to look at it through a telescope. Instead, this is what it would look like through an X-ray telescope, through a visible telescope, and through an infrared telescope combined. And so you can see a lot of the same structure that you saw in the optical picture. But then in addition, right in the burning core of this system, uh, not burning, I should say, but in the core of this system, um, you can see um, the pulsar itself and the surrounding dust just around the pulsar that's being brought to this X-ray energies and also eventually to the gamma ray energies. But the X-ray telescopes have a bit better resolution, so you can actually see kind of right into the middle there. Um, pulsars, wonderful systems, but we can get even uh, more exotic. So you've seen stars that are hundreds of times the mass of our sun. You've also seen these uh, these pulsars, which are almost two times the size, the mass of a sun, but then compressed into the super dense region. We also have active galactic nuclei. And so active galactic nuclei are supermassive black holes at the heart of galaxies. And these are special supermassive black holes um, where I'm talking about hundreds of millions of times the, uh, the mass of kind of traditional uh, systems. What we're talking about here is accreting systems. And so what these systems are doing is taking mass from the surrounding area around them and, and ending up accelerating that into jets. And so these jet structures you can see here, and jets are another powerful place um, where we can see shocks and we can see this particle acceleration. And so this is what the picture looks like. And if you zoom in just to this kind of jet region, these are the pictures you get all in optical. But because the object's so dim, we don't get kind of these few full, beautiful, full color images. Instead, you just get it in black and white. Um, but these are some of the oldest systems to gamma ray astronomers. And these are galaxies kind of far outside the Milky Way, but they're still producing these super energetic particles, which we can measure here on Earth. And actually, this is kind of if you were to want to zoom in to see kind of a picture visually in your mind of what's going on. These jet structures are what we're seeing over here. And then these large disk around it. So not this disk that's in this image, but if you were to zoom in way, 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 way further into the, the core of this galaxy, you'd see this dust get, disk, dusty disk um, that ends up falling into the black hole and producing these beautiful jets. And then once again, the gamma ray picture, 
is this guy down here. Uh, <laughs> and so also there's other ways we can measure cosmic rays, which I, I mentioned here just for the cosmic ray nuts. And um, this is um, through a very special uh, particle called a neutrino. And neutrinos are also sometimes considered as cosmic rays, but they're different in many ways. And so one of these was actually measured at the same time that we were seeing a gamma ray flaring event. So a flaring event is when a system gets uh, dramatically brighter over a short period of time. And so um, what that meant is that we had this kind of large mass injection event. And because of that, we also saw um, one of these neutrinos. So once again, more evidence that these systems are producing not only these energetic um, gamma rays, but also energetic cosmic rays. Then we get into more speculative targets. So speculative in terms of that gamma rays have not been seen from a lot of these sources, um, but they're potential candidates because we see them at other energy uh, or other wavelengths, and they seem to be energetic enough to produce gamma rays. Um, and so some of these are uh, include FRBs, which stands for fast radio bursts. And these are mysterious sources of radio emission that occur in just these millisecond flashes. And it's still unknown if cosmic rays could be produced in these systems. So what we see is that we see these radio flashes that are occurring all across the sky at really, really high rates. Um, and whether or not gamma rays and in turn cosmic rays are also being produced in these events would be really, really interesting because every single new place that we can find uh, gamma rays, we get a better understanding of the cosmic ray sky. Flaring stars are also a site of potential gamma rays. They haven't been observed in these systems yet, but they're really, really good candidates. And so these candidates here, um, flaring stars are um, just like when you know active galactic uh, nuclei are flaring. Oftentimes you can end up with these large magnetic events on um, even tiny stars. So one tenth the mass of the sun. And these large flaring events end up uh, brightening the star to be one of the kind of brightest systems in the sky or nearby. And so these uh, flaring star events could be sites of uh, gamma ray emission as well. And so the largest flares on these systems could also have impacts on the search for life because gamma rays are not very conducive to life. So although our atmosphere protects us from a lot of gamma rays, if there was enough gamma rays over a continued period of time, eventually our atmosphere would end up being um, completely destroyed. And so um, in systems where a planet is very close to a system that's producing a lot of gamma rays, then this would not be ideal for the source of life. And small stars, like I said, where some of these more uh, extreme events occur, are also the house of some of the most extreme flaring events. And so um, and it's also where we found most uh, exoplanets, planets around other stars. And so the search for gamma rays here in cosmic rays is also uh, impacting our search for life. Um, some dark matter models also predict um, the existence that there should be gamma ray emission coming from dark matter. Um, so there's processes by which um, dark matter can turn into uh, light and that light can be observed here from Earth. So these are very, very speculative models, but the hunt is on um, for uh, observing places where we see large amounts of dark matter um, based on its influence of other stars in the area. So um, stars will end up experiencing larger influences than the mass we can measure. And in because of that, we know that there's a large amount of dark matter in that region. And that dark matter, if we look at it through a gamma ray telescope, those regions, um, and we see gamma rays, then it could be some um, very clear evidence as to what dark matter is. Um, this has not been observed yet. Um, and the hunt uh, kind of continues for a lot of, in a lot of these sources. And when I say the hunt continues, I mean that more and better gamma ray telescopes continue to be developed, which is very exciting if you're like me and hopefully now uh, see the uh, immense value of gamma rays. And so um, these series of uh, larger and larger telescopes are being constructed to better image those showers and to observe larger swaths of the sky at the same time. And so Veritas only contained four telescopes and the next generation is con going to contain um, dozens. And so the next generation of telescopes have already begun their construction. 
um, and what it's called the Terenkov Telescope Array, the kind of three-dimensional model I show of which here, containing much larger telescopes like Veritas, these ones here, um, comparable size telescopes like these ones here, and then even smaller telescopes to kind of fill out a large array and better allow us to image these air showers are being built kind of as we speak. One has been completed at the site of Veritas down in Tucson, Arizona. And just for scale, again, you could see a very happy crowd of scientists um, because their telescope works, um, which is always a very uh, happy day if you're a scientist. And so just to kind of leave you guys with some notes um, here. So for 100 years, scientists have been fascinated with these high energy particles, and these particles still continue to hold mysteries. The most higher, highest energy particles and most highest energy environments are difficult even for gamma rays to measure. And so um, hunts continue to see how far in these um, energies can we find common sources uh, producing gamma rays. And Gamma rays also help to point us to the heart of some of the most extreme environments in the universe. And so allowing us to look at these things with different wavelengths of light can teach us different things about these, these environments. In this case, whether or not cosmic rays are being produced in high amounts in these systems. Um, knowledge about these sources will also continue to expand and the development of new exciting gamma ray observatories. So currently the kind of um, one of the numbers in the gamma ray sky is um, that map I showed you, that beautiful map of the gamma ray sky contained many little dots. And of those dots, still roughly 20% are unknown um, of what's producing them. And so we see gamma rays coming from that point in the sky, but we don't see um, other uh, wavelengths of light yet or know how to connect those wavelengths of light to those sources. And so there's about one fifth of the sky in terms of the gamma rays that we don't understand. And so um, increasing our sensitivity um, significantly like this, we're jumping kind of um, um, light years uh, with this next generation of telescope um, will allow us to kind of maybe whittle down that number so that we understand more and more of the gamma ray sky. Um, and in doing so, hopefully continue to expand our knowledge about cosmic rays. Um, but I'd be really excited to hear what you guys um, are curious about. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed this talk on, um, on cosmic rays and gamma rays themselves. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, I encourage everyone who's on the Zoom chat and who is watching us live on Facebook to please show your appreciation in the chat boxes. And yeah, you'll have plenty of time to do that as we start to have some questions come in for Matt. So Matt, first question to you. Uh, are the gamma ray point sources shown in the map of the gamma ray sky? Are those located within our galaxy or are they extra galactic or both? Yeah, so when we look towards the gamma ray sky again, so I'm going to zoom way back here. So um, hopefully nobody gets seasick. Um, here we have this beautiful picture of the gamma ray sky I showed. So this is coming from the Fermi telescope. And so uh, the ground-based gamma ray telescopes can only point towards very small patches of the sky. And so what they do instead, their strategy is they only observe kind of one or two of these things at a time instead of doing this full sky map. And so this is a little bit of a lower energy, but basically all of the sources you see above this disk here um, is coming from outside of our galaxy, most of these, not all, but most. And so these are coming from those um, active galactic nuclei, these um, accreting supermassive black holes. When we start to get into this mess here, which if you look in the optical, we can see is the center of the Milky Way, um, this mess here contains a lot of those pulsar systems I was talking about. So those are neutron stars from inside of our galaxy, um, from stars that had died long ago, but still within the Milky Way. Um, this also contains um, not as many, but some high mass star systems, the most, the highest mass star systems. Um, with, and so those, so, so, so the answer is yes, both, but um, yeah, we still don't understand uh, one fifth of these. So uh, those ones, if, if you can tell me if, if they're from within or outside of the galaxy, that'd be very helpful. Great, uh, thanks, thanks Matt. 
Next question, uh, what are the mirrors on gamma ray telescopes made of? Yeah, so, so gamma ray telescope mirrors are just like the mirror that you would have in um, your bathroom, but perhaps a little bit uh, a little bit finer because so gamma ray telescopes are not like traditional telescopes where we need the amount of um, high precision optics that other telescopes do. You'll notice here that you might look at this picture and find it a bit strange. Uh, if you've ever done uh, optical observations in your backyard, oftentimes it's not recommended that you leave your telescope out uh, outside um, after you're done with it. And so our mirrors have this protective coating on the top to prevent um, a lot of the impact of dust and um, and just desert sand blowing in the wind, um, but they are just normal optical mirrors. And so um, nothing, you know, that needs to be, um, and, and it's made, it's composed of each one of these little facets. So our mirrors also don't need to be this kind of large smooth mirror you see in there because we're not actually looking to find very fine resolution in our pictures because we're, we're not imaging um, the actual gamma rays themselves, we're imaging this large cone of light. So we can use a coarser resolution telescope than kind of traditional optics. Awesome, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, next question, uh, why does the Trenkov light comb seem to be in the reverse direction compared to a sonic uh, boom? Yeah, so the Trenkov light cone is composed of many different um, uh, particles. And so these particles, the, the photons end up being emitted at a constant angle. And so from the direction of the particle, and when you stack up all those angles, you get um, an inverse cone. So it's not like these things are not shooting off in other directions, but the kind of primary direction of stacking all of these different, um, uh, all of these different fronts is that you get a cone at, um, forming downwards. And it's not, and the cone happens really rapidly as well. It's more of a kind of rapid pancake that ends up falling down um, than kind of a, a cone that sticks there forever. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, uh, big question here. Uh, why are cosmic rays important? What information can they tell us? And do they have any known function or impact on their surroundings? Or are they just evidence of important natural processes on their own? So there's two things. You can kind of think of this problem two ways. And it's really exciting to think about it in both ways. So one way is if you care about particle physics, then cosmic rays are some of the uh, best products of a particle accelerator you could hope for. So you can't build particle accelerators that are large enough to produce the energies that we see in cosmic rays. And so because of that, these cosmic rays end up that we measure here on Earth are, are in similar ways we could think of them as the products of a particle accelerator, where that particle accelerator is a supermassive black hole. And so if you care about particle physics, you can, you can run experiments on these cosmic rays um, here on Earth that you would never be able to run um, on your own. Um, but you can also think about the reverse direction. You say, I know a lot about particle physics, but I care more about astrophysics. And so what you can do is infer properties of these larger systems um, from the cosmic rays that you see from them. And so um, there's many natural processes that we don't fully understand in astrophysics. And so um, observing them at higher energies allows us to figure out kind of the limits of these systems. And so oftentimes um, where things stop, the highest energies that they can produce tells us a lot about um, kind of the mass, the system, the magnetic fields um, that are that are going on in these in these other exotic systems, which in themselves are just very interesting because these exotic systems are places where you know our understanding of the physics of matter begin to break down. And so, if you care what stuff is made of, how stuff works, the fundamentals of that, then you can probe them in neutron stars. If you care about um, the fabric of the universe and stuff like that, then you can probe them in these supermassive black holes. Super. Uh, a curiosity next, uh, do cosmic rays any have anything to do with uh, lightning or sprites observed during storms? Yeah, so there's a lot of, so so when the Fermi satellite first launched, they um, there's these things called gamma ray bursts. And so I don't talk too much about gamma ray bursts in this talk, but gamma ray bursts um, 
like fast radio bursts were a mystery for a long time. And so these gamma ray bursts are these flashes of gamma rays. And they were first observed um, or thought to be kind of um, speculated about when uh, satellites were being launched to monitor for nuclear activity during the Cold War. And so what you want is you really want a satellite to see if gamma rays are being produced on Earth because gamma rays on Earth are usually coming from kind of nuclear tests. And um, what they found was that they were seeing gamma rays coming from um, from space. Um, and they could measure that these gamma rays were coming out from outside the solar system, but not much more. And so with, um, with gamma ray bursts, the um, interesting part about them was that uh, was that, so we now know that they're coming from merging neutron stars. Can you just clarify the question right here? Because I think I'm getting off track, but uh, just one more time, what was the question? Yeah, if um, gamma rays have uh, anything to do with lightning observed during storms. Yeah, and so, and yeah, and so um, these things that were being observed way off, we start to build dedicated telescopes to measure them. And so one of those was the gamma ray burst monitor on Fermi, the satellite that also did that all sky map I showed, measuring gamma rays at not quite the energies that we measured them at Veritas, but a little bit lower. Um, and when it launched, it, it received, started to receive a bunch of flashes from here on Earth. And um, those couldn't be gamma ray bursts, but also it was very unlikely that there were that many nuclear tests going on. And um, what they actually were able to do was correlate um, this activity of thunderstorms on Earth with um, these, what they call terrestrial gamma ray flashes. But what's interesting about uh, them is that uh, the charged particles, because they're traveling along the magnetic field lines of Earth, um, it's very difficult to actually track back when uh, which thunderstorm caused the terrestrial gamma ray flash, unless you use kind of time. So what they so so it was a big it was a big problem for a while. But yeah, um, uh, terrestrial gamma ray flashes are measured all the time. Uh, they're a big problem for the Fermi satellite, but uh, they're pretty well sorted now. Uh, but they do come from thunderstorms. So they're actually yeah there is sites of gamma rays, but not to the energies we're talking about here. Very cool. Uh... When would you use the term uh, gamma rays versus cosmic rays? So gamma rays are photons. Uh, cosmic rays are um, any particle. And so oftentimes there's, um, depending on kind of what media you read, in the media, these terms are often mixed. Um, and so cosmic rays is a broader category. Um, cosmic rays often sometimes also include neutrinos and sometimes don't include neutrinos. And so neutrinos are a mysterious particle. Um, we know a lot about neutrinos, but um, neutrinos are very difficult to measure, um, which is why I didn't include them in classical kind of cosmic rays. Um, they're very weakly interacting. And so unlike cosmic rays, which end up being incident on the atmosphere and then producing these large showers, um, neutrinos end up passing through the earth mostly um, without interacting at all. Only some Neutrinos end up interacting. So the largest detectors we have were deep underground to filter out all of these other cosmic rays. Um, so yeah, so um, the category of cosmic rays is a very broad one, but gamma rays refers explicitly to high energy photons. Awesome, thanks for the clarification. Uh, next up, uh, uh, what do the images from orbiting telescopes look like in comparison to say what you've shown here? Yeah, so the the orbiting um, ones look like this unfolded picture I show here from Fermi. So this is Fermi. This is a satellite actually from space. And so um, in space, you don't have to... Um, you don't have the atmosphere blocking out a lot of these gamma rays. They're not producing showers. They're just producing directly in your detector. You measure them directly. So the, the, the gamma ray photon actually hits this instrument and interacts with a large block. Um, and from that, they end up uh, feeding back the position of um, the original photon. And so um, all sky, these are very powerful, but you can only build a satellite so big. And the size of the satellite, you can think of it like a stopping power, right? So if you were to shoot something that's not very energetic, it wouldn't quite get through. If you shoot something that's moderately energetic, it would make it most of the way through and you get a really nice image. If it's too energetic, it'll shoot right through. Um, and so the atmosphere is much larger than a satellite that we could send out. And so, um, so, so these pictures here show a lower energy, but they're able to view kind of the whole sky, whereas the images from... 
um, from gamma ray telescopes on the ground. They have smaller fields of view. Um, they're limited by, they can only observe during the night. Um, and they look like this. But if you were to stitch together a wide picture of the whole sky, you could, it would be a bunch of little boxes every time the telescope is pointed in that place. And you'd see these little red dots here overlapping with the dots in the other, uh, the other map. Sweet, thank you. Uh, um, safety concern. Uh, could a sufficiently powerful gamma ray burst wipe out life on Earth? What's the nearest gamma ray source? So um, one of the nearest gamma ray sources um, that produce high energy gamma rays is the crab. And so the crab is our favorite here. It's one of the brightest sources in the gamma ray sky. It's quite nearby. And so the gamma ray um, uh, with, with this system, um, when the initial star exploded that produced this, um, I believe this one happened in about 1054 AD. And so um, during these explosions, they're tremendously bright. They end up being one of the brightest systems in the sky, but uh, you know, life wasn't wiped out then. And so um, it is all about how close the source is. Um, and so there are nearby stars that will eventually produce supernova, um, but most of these, none of these systems, you can take my bet on it will happen during um, our lifetimes. But uh, um, in terms of actual distances, um, I don't know directly, but there's no nothing to worry about with these sources. Um, most of the supernova we measure are in galaxies very far away. Um, most of the pulsars that we measure um, explode thousands of years ago and um, and uh, most of them are sufficiently far away that all it experiences is a bright flash of light. Sweet, thank you. Uh, yeah, if, um, so we're at eight o'clock, which is uh, technically our end time, but we're getting a lot of questions in. So if you're good to stick on for a bit, Matt, uh, then I'd keep asking questions if that's okay. Yeah, I'm good for about 10, 10, 15 minutes more of questions. Um, if people are excited to ask questions, I'm excited to answer. Awesome. That's great. Thanks a lot, Matt. So, okay. So here we go. Um, instead of um, ground-based observatories, isn't it better to build more space-based detectors? So it depends on what energy you're interested in, right? Like, so I talked about, you can only build a space-based detector so large. Um, but with the, uh, with the gamma ray telescopes on the ground, um, you also can, there's, there's many factors that go into this, right? And so is it easier to expand a telescope on the ground than it is one in space? Well, if you need to add another part to something, that's much easier to do that when you're on the ground. And so ground-based telescopes are easier to upgrade, easier to maintain, and with technology continuing to grow at a rapid pace, a lot of the telescopes that we have up in space are using technology from 20, 30, 40 years ago, right? So none of this is, um, none of this is modern, um, and it's really difficult to repair. So you'll often see these kind of tragic stories of these of these space-based telescopes end up, you know, and reaching the end of their lifetime, and no longer being usable. Um, whereas with ground-based telescopes, often they can extend their lifetime easily by kind of 20 years past when somebody was expecting them to continue to operate. Um, but also it's, it's the energy that's really the big difference. Um, what I propose is why don't we build more space-based gamma ray detectors and ground-based gamma ray detectors? Um, I, I don't have a, I don't see a problem there. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, me neither. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I someone is really excited to ask you, can you explain how the dark matter model is related to gamma rays? So the dark matter model um, relies on um, dark matter particles self-annihilating into, um, into an observable gamma ray photon. And so um, there's many, 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 many different models of dark matter. And none of them are absolutely conclusive or else it wouldn't be one of the biggest mysteries in astronomy today. And so, um, but what we can do is basically take these models that have powerful predictions and continue to test them. That's what scientists do. And so one of those models is this model where you have this dark matter particle that through interactions with itself 
will end up producing visible light. And this will be high energy light. And so um, it's not a process which we know happens, uh, but it's a process that we think we could based on, that's well justified in the particle physics. Um, and so if you were to, if this does exist, then what we'd expect that places where you see a lot of dark matter, you'd see a lot of gamma rays. And these gamma rays wouldn't be associated with any optical or radio counterpart. So when we look for places where we see gamma rays, oftentimes we see a pulsar or we see an active galactic nuclei. But if we find these dark matter, uh, these uh, gamma ray sources with no other component, nothing else that can explain it, then there, then uh, those are good candidates to observe um, as possible kind of dark matter targets. And so um, places which we currently study where ongoing work is, is the galactic center. The center of our galaxy is where we expect a lot of dark matter to exist, but also in these dwarf galaxies that surround us, these, these where we see an excess amount of dark matter uh, compared to other regions. And so we study those, integrate them over a long period of time and see if we can measure any uh, gamma rays coming from these locations that couldn't be explained using just conventional sources. Very neat. Thank you. Nothing yet. Nothing yet. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Dark matter, man. <laughs> Next um, question I will ask. Uh, apologies. Um, can you uh, elaborate on the what causes the blue go blow? Blue glow of Cherenkov radiation. Yeah, so the blue glow of Cherenkov radiation is um, just a, a sonic boom of light, right? So particles are extremely energetic, right? Hey, Matt, you suddenly became uh, much quieter. Is that better? Is that better? Sorry, so just a second. Is that. Let me. How is that? Is that better? Worse. Just uh, give me a second. Yeah, it's about the same, but we can still hear you. So uh, we'll we'll wrap this up shortly. Yeah, just give me one second here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, uh. Testing. Oh, okay. So I might be a little bit quieter. So sorry for that. But um, yeah, so. When we're looking at this, uh, these, uh, yeah, the question was about um, uh, Trenkov radiation. So Trenkov radiation, right, is this mysterious blue glow. And so it's, uh, it's just particles that are traveling faster than the speed of light in the medium. And so when particles do that, it's all about, so one of the biggest um, connections that was ever made in uh, physics was this connection between electricity and magnetism, which doesn't seem connected here, but it's also connected to light, which is why we call light electromagnetic radiation. And so when you have charged particles moving through a medium, they end up interacting in this way with the surrounding matter um, to produce this electromagnetic radiation. And if you were to run through and look at all these little wave fronts that are moving through as it moves through and sum those all together, then what you'd see is that um, these particles that are traveling through, when they travel faster than the speed of light um, in that medium, it ends up producing the same kind of calculation that you could run through with um, a sonic boom. It's just these catching up of uh, different wave fronts as you move through. And so, um, and, uh, and so you end up producing this, this blue glow, but it only happens for the most energetic uh, particles or else they're just slowed down by the medium and, um, and it ends up not producing mysterious light or else everywhere you'd walk, you'd see a blue glow behind you, which is not what you see. But, it's only ha but if you were to go fast enough, then you would also have blue glow. Very cool. All right, I'll have the, I'll wrap up with the last uh, two questions here. So thanks everyone for your questions. Uh, someone is asking, what are the impact of cosmic rays on human beings exposed to them, like, for example, astronauts? And in the same line, could cosmic rays eventually become dangerous if climactic changes continue to degrade the atmosphere? Under yeah, so, um, so yeah, so those are both really interesting questions and they're open fields of study. So day-to-day -day basis, 
cosmic rays don't affect people on the ground, but you may have heard that you're exposed to more radiation as you end up. So the, the primary concern with radiation is that, and cosmic rays are a form of this radiation, um, is that when they interact, highly energetic particles interact with cells, um, it ends up causing, um, uh, in some cells, uh, cancer. And so um, as you um, may have heard in airplanes, if you fly too often, you elevate your risk of cancer. And the reason for that is that you're traveling higher in the atmosphere the same way Hess did with his balloon. And as you bring yourself higher in the atmosphere, uh, you're less protected. And because of that, you elevate your risk of, um, of cancer. So it's not like every time a cosmic ray hits you, you'll get cancer, but um, you elevate your risk. Um, that one of these, one of these, one of these chains doesn't end up going properly. Um, so it is a problem for astronauts as well. Um, they're exposed to much higher levels of radiation than we are, which is why you hear a lot about radiation shielding in space and all these other different um, uh, techniques of kind of removing radiation. Um, I don't believe the atmospheric degradation with, um, with regards to climate change. The primary problem oftentimes is that the atmosphere with the ozone layer is getting thinner. Um, and then also the atmosphere is getting um, more CO2. And so it's pretty complicated uh, to say whether or not the cosmic ray rate is going to be dramatically affected um, on the ground, um, but it's definitely going to have an impact. Um, and then uh, additionally, kind of as a neat little aside in the way that these things often happen is that computers are affected by cosmic rays as well. So if a cosmic ray goes into um, a storage system on a computer, um, it often causes, uh, it can cause what's called a bit flip. And a bit flip is where you switch one number from a zero to a one, which could cause the number that's saved in your computer to change as well. So this is also of interest to um, uh, computer um, technicians, not technicians, but you know, hardware developers. And because you'll end up with these tiny little changes in your computer caused by cosmic rays. And so, you know, um, it's a, there are often times if you're not, extremely beautifully interested in the wonderful physics behind them, they are a bit of a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which is why we should understand them. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right, final question here. Can you give any advice to an undergraduate physics student who wants to study high energy physics and that field? Uh, the best thing you can, um best advice you can have to become a high energy physics is uh, maintain a high energy in your studies. Um, and so um, the best advice is to go in and, you know, try really hard, make sure you do all your homework uh, and uh, get good at physics first. And then once you're good at physics, you know, everyone will be clamoring to, for your help. Um, and so, uh, yeah. And so, um, but Whenever you, if you, if you have an interest in high energy physics, I would say your interest is probably in the best place to be, uh, but that's probably a biased opinion. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt, for this great question and answer period. I apologize to those of you who, uh, whose questions we did not get to in time, but I hope that you learned something that you learn something regardless. So with that, please give uh, lots of praise to Matt in the Zoom chat and in the Facebook comments, and we will be signing off. Thank you so much for joining us.